So this is revision of the AQA forces topic. Now the thing about forces is they are measured in the Newton and there are really two different sorts. We have contact forces and non-contact forces. So contact forces are where you have two surfaces in contact. So we're talking about friction, air resistance or drag. You've got the tension, which is maybe when something is being pulled like a spring. And then normal contact force, I'll come on to in a little bit of time. Non-contact forces, they can act over distance. So we might talk about the gravitational attraction between two masses. Maybe if you've got a negative and a positively charged object, you've got some electrostatic force or the magnetic force as well. Now, the thing about forces is that these are vectors. And a vector is something that has size and direction. And what that means is we can then represent a force with an arrow where the length of the arrow tells you about the size of the force and the way the arrow pointing is telling you about the direction. That's different to a scalar quantity, which only has size. Now, something that often causes confusion is the difference between mass and weight. And weight is a force, and that's caused by the mass of an object in a gravitational field. So like I said, we always measure our weight in newtons. We measure our mass in kilograms. And that means that the gravitational field strength is measured in newtons per kilogram. And this field strength really depends about which object we're considering. On the Moon, for example, it's about 1.6 newtons per kilogram. On Earth, it's about 9.8 newtons per kilogram. So if you need to convert from kilograms into newtons, you just multiply by 9.8. Now, in order to actually measure the weight of an object, uh, what we can use is a newton meter. Whereas I suppose, strictly speaking, if you want to look at the mass of an object, uh, we should use a mass balance. And that would then give you a value often in grams or kilograms. And you've got to remember as well that the weight of an object, this acts at the center of mass. Now, the thing about forces is if we have an object, which I've just got here, and maybe there's a five Newton force acting to the left and a 10 Newton force acting to the right, what we can do is we can replace both of these arrows with a single arrow to show the overall force acting on the object. Now, if you've got 10 Newtons that way, and five newtons that way, that means overall there's going to be a five newton force acting to the right. And this is what we call the resultant force. And this is really useful if we think about real objects. Perhaps we just have an apple which is just sat on the desk here. At the moment it's not moving, and that means there's going to be a balanced overall force. What we can do is we can maybe draw a diagram of the same thing. So this is my apple, and what we might find is that there's a force acting down. Uh, in this case it would be the weight of the object. Uh, and then there's another force, which is an equal size arrow, but in the opposite direction. And this one here fits the force. This is now the force of the desk pushing back. And that's what we call our normal contact force. Now, if we had another object, uh, which maybe had a force in this direction and a force down here, we can again look at the overall force. And what we can do then is add up these two vectors together. And effectively, um, if I just put in a, a line like this, the resultant force of these two arrows, because there's one to the right and one which is down, is going to be to the right and down. So this again is another way of showing that resultant force. And because it's a vector, we're also often interested in the angle that force is acting in. So it's not just the size of the resultant force, it's also the direction that it's acting in. Something we can do which is similar to this is maybe we had a force acting at a certain angle. I'm going to call that theta. We can also resolve this force into its vertical and horizontal components. So if there's a force which is acting uh, up and to the right, effectively that there's a size of a force acting upwards and a certain size of force acting to the right. And we can see again how the length of the arrow to the right is the same as the size of how much the arrow there goes to the right. Hopefully that makes sense. I will have some more videos that explain this in a little bit more detail. But drawing diagrams is a really useful way of maybe looking at all the forces on the object, finding out the resultant force, and then finding the size and the direction of that resultant force. Now the other thing about forces is if we have an object and we apply a force to it over a certain distance, we're then doing work. So this thing here, work, is quite an important concept. And if you want to look at the work done on an object, I'm going to call that W, so this is the work done, that's equal to the force applied multiplied by the distance that it goes. So in the case of moving this Lego block, we need to think about how far it's travelled in the direction of the force and the size of the force. Now, m work done and energy transferred are both measured in joules. We've got our force measured in newtons and our displacement, 
the distance that it travels in the direction of the force is measured in metres. And this then gives us the definition of what one joule is. So one joule is a work done when a force of one newton causes a displacement of one metre. The next thing we're going to look at is forces and elasticity. And basically this is, might be when you're bending, you're compressing or you're stretching an object, and especially the normal kind of standard spring that we have here. Now, if it's elastic, it means it goes back to its original shape when the force has been taken off. However, something which is inelastic, perhaps a spring that is bent too much, it doesn't return to its original shape, and then it's not elastic anymore. It's inelastic, or we can also call that plastic. Now, for that spring, um, the force applied is going to be proportional to the extension of it. Extension means how much longer it's got. In fact, there's an equation that we use which says that force is equal to k times e. So again, we measure our force in newtons, our extension in metres, and this then gives what we call a spring stiffness. Uh, that has the units of newtons per metre. Now, that's the amount of force required to extend something, but if you do extend something, that spring can then store some energy in the elastic potential store. And we can also look at the equation that says the elastic energy stored is equal to a half ke squared. So this really depends on how stiff that spring is and how much it's been extended. So again, this one is a force which is measured in newtons, but this is the energy stored measured in joules. Now, if you apply a force at a distance from an axle, you can then cause some rotation, perhaps the wheels of a car or maybe the steering wheel inside. And what we can then consider are moments, levers and gears. Now, the turning effect of a force is what we call the moment. And it's basically equal to the force multiplied by the perpendicular distance, that's important, the word perpendicular, distance from the pivot to the line of action of the force. So what we're saying here is that the moment, which is capital M, is equal to the force times distance. And here I'm going to use D for distance to show it's that distance from the axis. Now, uh, because we measure force in newtons, and our distance in metres, this gives our moment in the unit of the newton metre. That's very different to the newtons per metre that we have for our spring constant over here. Now if you have an object which isn't rotating but it's balanced, what we can then say is that the moments which are going clockwise are equal to the anti-clockwise moments. And if I just put that in shorthand over here, we can say that uh, the clockwise moments are equal to the anti-clockwise moments if it's balanced. Now in the simplest example you have some kind of seesaw, if you know that there's a certain force at a distance, maybe going anti-clockwise, and you know the size of the force that you can apply, you can then work out the distance that you need to apply that force to make sure that this thing here is in equilibrium, it's balanced and it's not rotating. Something that we also need to consider is pressure, and this is the pressure in fluids, so it could be things like gases or liquids. Now to calculate the pressure at the surface of the fluid, that pressure, which is small p, is the amount of force per unit area. Now by convention, we measure our force in newtons, our area in square metres, and that means the units for pressure are newtons per square metre, but we can also use another unit, which is a pascal, that's capital P, small a. So if we're using our force in newtons, area in metres squared, we can then give also give our pressure in pascals. For example, atmospheric pressure, the kind of pressure of the air which is surrounding you and me at the moment, is 101 kilopascals. So when it comes to pressure, we often have very big numbers. Now we can also think about the pressure in a column of liquid. Now really, the deeper you go down, so the greater the height that you go under the surface, the more water there is going to be above you which is pushing you down. So as you go deeper and deeper, the pressure increases. It also depends on, upon which liquid you have. Water isn't uh, particularly dense. If you had a column of mercury instead, because there's more stuff in a certain volume, uh, the density of that material also affects the um, pressure that you're going to feel. And finally, it really depends upon where you are in the galaxy. If you went to Jupiter, or one of these big planets with a bigger gravitational field strength, you'd also then get a greater pressure as you went under. So we can say that the pressure is equal to rho gh, so the pressure depends upon the density, the gravitational field strength, and the height. Density is measured in kilograms per cubic metre. Gravitational field strength is newtons per kilogram. The height is in metres. And again, the density, hopefully you can see this, is measured in pascals. 
Now, if you submerge an object in this liquid here, there's going to be a force acting upwards on it. This is called upthrust, and it's because there's a difference in the pressure at the top and the bottom of that object. And this is the reason that things like ships, for example, they still float in water. So upthrust, or buoyancy, is a force um, that acts in a liquid or a fluid on objects. So I'm beginning to run out of room, so let's go onto this page here. The final thing is atmospheric pressure. Now the atmosphere is basically above the Earth's surface, so this is supposed to be the Earth down here. There's a very thin layer of gas. Now as you go higher and higher, the density of this decreases. Now because pressure is caused by the impact of these particles on the surface, if you've got less particles impacting, that means as you go higher and higher, we go from a high pressure down here, and as you go higher and higher, the pressure gets smaller and smaller. Now the next thing to consider is motion of objects. Now we've already heard that there are scalar quantities which just have size, and also vector quantities that have a size and direction. Now a good example of a scalar quantity is speed. So speed is just how quickly something is traveling. And these are just some of the speeds of everyday objects. So if you're walking along, it means that you're going at 1.5 meters per second. So every second you go another one and a half meters. You also maybe need to think about things like the speed of sound, which is much quicker. So sound travels at 330 meters per second, depending on kind of exactly where you are in terms of the atmospheric conditions. But things like light and other electromagnetic waves, they travel at 300,000 thousand meters per second. So even quicker than that. Now, um, scalar quantities also include things like distance, but there's a vector equivalent called displacement. And this includes not just the distance that something is moved, but also how far it's, the direction that it's moved from its start point. So vectors always have a direction as well. Another vector quantity, a bit like speed, is velocity. And at GCSE, we define velocity uh, of an object as the speed in a given direction. And we can also look at how quickly this velocity changes, which is then our acceleration. Now, looking at the relationship between distance and speed, we can say that s is equal to vt. Now, this is confusing. We don't use the letter s for speed. That's just something that we don't do. Instead, we use the letter v to represent speed or velocity, and this is measured in meters per second. S actually stands for our displacement. So think about the S uh, for displacement or the S in distance. So S is our distance in meters, and then time is in seconds. Now, another more useful way of looking at this equation is that V is equal to S divided by T. So the speed is equal to the, dis the distance divided by the time taken. And if you want to work out how quickly something is going, you simply need to measure the distance that something's gone and then time how long it takes to go that distance. Now there's one little interesting thing about velocity if you're doing the physics, uh, and that basically means that you can have something where um, something's velocity might be changing, but its speed stays constant. And this is where you've got something which is moving in a circle. So maybe you've got an object and it's rotating in a circle, um, it might be going 5 metres per second, so it might have the constant speed, but its direction is constantly changing. So sometimes it's going left, sometimes it's going down, sometimes it's going right, and then sometimes it's going up. So when you've got circular motion, this is a special case where you've got an object which has a constant speed but a changing velocity. Now something which it's really useful to do is to draw different graphs to represent an object which is moving. Now one of these is called a distance time graph. So we measure our distance in meters up here and we have our time in seconds along the bottom. And what we might then do is plot some data for an object and we can see how its distance changes with time. Now on this graph here, the gradient of that line is equal to how quickly the distance changes per second. And that means the gradient is equal to our speed, V. Sometimes, however, you might get a curvy line and then in order to work out the speed of that object or the velocity of that object from this line here, what you then do is you draw a tangent to that line. Once you've drawn a tangent to that line at the point that you're interested in, you can then measure the gradient by looking at the change in y and the change in x values. So you can actually then work out the value of the speed on this curved line. Another type of graph which is really useful is the VT graph. So this is our speed in meters per second. We've got our time in seconds here. And again, what we can then look at is 
maybe how an object's velocity changes over time. Now for this graph here, the gradient is going to be equal to the rate of change of velocity. We're looking at how quickly that velocity changes per second, and that means our gradient is then equal to our acceleration. And actually, um, the equation that we can use to work out the acceleration of an object is equal to the change in velocity divided by time taken. So for this, we measure our velocity in meters per second, our time in seconds, and that means our acceleration then is the amount of meters per second per second. So the units for acceleration are meters per second squared. And we can often find that from a VT graph by looking at the gradient. And if we actually look at the area under this VT graph here, the area is equal to the velocity times the time, which we saw over here, the velocity times the time is equal to the distance traveled. So under a velocity time graph, the area is equal to the displacement. Now, when we look at the change in velocity, what we're really looking at is the difference between the final velocity, which is v, and the initial velocity, which is u. So we can also say that this change in velocity is equal to v minus u. But now we can actually introduce another equation, which says that v squared minus u squared is equal to 2as. So this one here uh, looks a little bit confusing. Effectively, this is our final velocity in meters per second, take away our initial velocity in meters per second. Often this is just zero in lots of equations that you might, or questions that you might be given. A is our acceleration in meters per second squared, and then our time here is in seconds. So our distance is measured in meters. So if you get a question and you can identify what you know from the question, you can often decide which equation you can then use to work out your final answer. Now, if you had an object which starts falling, um, initially it's going to accelerate quite quickly and it's going to get faster and faster. Now, for the apple falling towards the ground, there's going to be a constant downwards force called weight, and this doesn't change. But its air resistance increases as this gets faster and faster. In fact, if we were to plot a graph, uh, a velocity time graph of the motion of a falling object under gravity, especially where you've got air resistance, we find that the graph does something like this. Now, the reason for this is that it gets to a point where its velocity doesn't get any quicker. And this point here is where the object has reached terminal velocity. And when the object is traveling at terminal velocity, there's no resultant force. So the weight in this case is going to be equal to the air resistance. I'm just going to put that AR for air resistance. That means there's no net force in it and it doesn't get any quicker. Now, there are three Newton's laws that you need to remember. Now, Newton's first law basically says that if there's the resultant force acting on an object is zero, so there's no resultant force in it, then stationary objects remain stationary, but things which are moving continue to move at the same velocity. So, for example, if you've got a racing car which is travelling as fast as it possibly can down a nice straight road, there's going to be a point where the air resistance is equal to the thrust of the engine and it doesn't get any faster. We then have Newton's second law. Now, basically, this says if there is a resultant force on an object, then the object is going to accelerate. And the size of that acceleration really depends upon the mass of the object and also the force that's being applied. So we can often write this uh, as F equals MA. Now, this is just the equation form of Newton's second law. So we've got our force in Newtons, our mass in kilograms, and our acceleration in meters per second squared. And again, just to say that the acceleration of an object is proportional to the resultant force in it. So you get a bigger acceleration for a bigger force. Uh, and it's inversely proportional to the mass of the object. So that means that you get a smaller acceleration when you have a bigger mass for a certain force that's been applied. And then finally, we've also got to complete the set Newton's third law. And this simply states that whenever two objects interact, the forces they exert on each other are equal and opposite. So what that means is if we have the moon, for example, uh, and this is being attracted to the Earth at the moment, the force of the attraction of the Earth on the moon is the same as the force of attraction of the moon on the Earth. And what we then have are a force pair. So that's Newton's third law. So a way to think about this is that if the force is equal to zero, then objects which initially were at, uh, had no velocity stay at zero, objects that were moving still keep moving at a constant velocity. Here, if there is a force, uh, then that force is going to be causing an acceleration. And here, 
what we're saying is that if you've got an object A and an object B, the force that they exert on each other are going to be equal and opposite. And here the mass is what we often call the inertial mass. And that's basically because things which are still want to stay still and things which are moving want to stay moving. And this inertial mass is basically their resistance to wanting to change what they're doing. And if we want to define inertial mass, then we pretty much define it as the ratio of force to acceleration for an object. Now, I've pretty much run out of room again, so let's continue this on the page below. So the next thing we need to look at is the stopping distance for a vehicle. Now, this is basically the total distance uh, that a vehicle travels, um, which includes the driver's reaction time when they're thinking about uh, and actually reacting to something they might see ahead, and then the distance that the car then or the vehicle then takes to stop. So this is your stopping distance. Now the thinking distance is going to be affected by things uh, of the driver. So this might include things like tiredness, by alcohol, by drugs, both legal and illegal, and also things like distractions, including mobile phones. So that's what's going to affect how quickly the driver reacts. But once they put the brakes on, that uh, factors that affect how their braking distance might be applied, might be, might be changed, include the condition of the roads. So it could be something which is maybe wet, or icy, uh, we're thinking about the condition of the tyres and the brakes. And of course these and the total stopping distance are also going to be affected by how quickly that car is going. Pretty simply, the faster you're going, the bigger the stopping distance is going to be. And if we think back to the energy topic, the reason that a vehicle is slowing down is because there's a couple of brake pads which um, go onto the, the brake inside the wheel. And what this is doing is then transferring some of the initial kinetic energy store of the car into the thermal energy store of the brakes, which get hotter, and also the surroundings, which heat up as well. Something we also look at is momentum. Uh, and momentum is simply defined as the mass times the velocity. So momentum, confusingly has the symbol little p for momentum from the word impetus and this is equal to mass times velocity. Now for this we measure our mass in kilograms, our velocity in meters per second and that means the unit for momentum are kilograms meters per second. Now this is also a vector quantity because it really depends on the direction that you're going and you might have maybe a positive momentum or even a negative momentum. And it's really important that you try not to get momentum confused with kinetic energy, which also depends on the mass and the velocity of an object, but that then has a unit of joules. Now, in a closed system, uh, what we can say is that the total momentum before an event is equal to the total momentum afterwards. So what we can say is that the momentum before is equal to the momentum afterwards. Now, if you're doing the full GCSE physics, you might need to do some calculations as well. So perhaps you had an object which is traveling along and it hits a stationary object and the two things move off together. If you know the total momentum of that moving object at the start, you can then work out the total momentum of the two things that move off together. So it might be that you're looking at the mass of an object uh, times its initial velocity. And this is then going to be equal to the total mass times the combined velocity at the end. So this is where it's worth spending a bit of time doing some calculations and actually practicing a few questions about this. Now, the other thing is that we've already seen the equation from Newton's second law that F equals MA, and also that A is equal to the change in velocity divided by time. So what I'm gonna do is combine these two together and I'm gonna replace this A with this term over here. So we can then say that F is equal to M times the change in velocity divided by the time. And if you've got the mass times the change in velocity, then this is also then equal to the change in momentum. So we can then say that the force is equal to the change in momentum divided by time. And what this basically says is that the force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. So what this means is that if you had a collision or something or an impact, if you change the momentum of an object more slowly, less force is going to be felt by that object. So this is why we have crumple zones on cars, it's why we have airbags, it's why we have soft pillows. Because what you're doing is you're still changing that momentum of the object, you're still slowing it down. But if you slow it down slower, it's going to experience less force. And that then means that there's going to be a less effect for maybe people involved in real life scenarios. And finally, that's it. We've done all of the forces topic for AQA GCSE. It's been a big one. Hopefully there's been something here which has been useful. Thanks for watching.